Hello community of People's Church and friends, uh, how are you today? We're here to talk about Pentecost, my favorite holiday and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So we're gonna pray first. Holy Spirit, thank you for giving us an encounter with you. Jesus, you are the Word. And every time that we have an encounter with the Word, every time that we go to your Word and we embrace your Word, we have an encounter with you. And as we encounter you, we can receive from you that Word that we are expecting to receive, that answer that we're expecting to receive, that power that we're expecting to receive, that fire, that motivation, that resource that we were feeling lack of and that connection that we need to succeed that wisdom that we are expecting from heaven that changes everything thank you because you give us an experience today that changes everything In the name of jesus amen so pentecost Pentecost is a holiday that was consuming those days uh, the Feast of the Week. So seven weeks after the Passover. This is the day where they celebrated the abundance of the harvest. And it was already a celebration for the Jewish people. And for me, what it comes is the accomplishment of there is more. There is more for our lives and there is more for heaven. When Jesus said, heaven on earth, pray heaven on earth, leave heaven on earth because there is more for you. This is one of the days that that more is revealed to us. In John 17, three, Jesus said, Eternal life means to know and experience you as the only true God and to know and experience Jesus Christ, the Son whom you have sent. He wants us not to just have some kind of uh, knowledge, some kind of uh, mental knowledge and, and reasoning of who He is, but he wants us to have this deep connection of love, that we feel love, that we have this acceptance in his heart and that we know that, and that we can experience that, that we are accepted no matter what, as the bottom line of who we are. And that is our starting point for our relationship with God. And that's what Jesus came to do. And that is one of the, of the reasons, the bottom reasons, what Jesus did in his life, revealing what eternal life means to really know God from that perspective of love. But Jesus said many things during his ministry on earth that the disciples and everyone around him did not understand. They had no idea what was he talking about. But all of that opened a lot of portals for them to explore more, to get into the unknown of what the heavenly realm could mean invading earth, or what the kingdom of heaven, when it comes to earth, what could that mean? And they, they had these ideas, but they couldn't imagine what could that be actually for their lives. So Jesus tried to explain the best that he could and say, hey, understand, this is something practical. This is something good for you to know and to live. But they really did not understand. So just imagine for a moment what would mean living all that time with Jesus every day, receiving his love, re receiving his encouraging words, receiving all that the Messiah is, this this son of God that they were expecting for thousands of years and sharing with him, 
sharing the wisdom, sharing the love, sharing the encouragement and and thinking now, changing this, this mindset to think, to believe that now everything is possible, that all things that they have hoped that Israel could be something important on earth, that now all things that they have ever lacked of, now things could change, that things could be possible, restored to the best possible that they could imagine. But the best possible that the disciples and that the Jewish leaders could imagine was not what God could imagine. So there was there were some expectations, but they couldn't imagine when he was talking what was really about. And uh, Pastor Jim gave us the full explanation of what was happening uh, when Jesus resurrected and he encountered them. Uh, and let's take some of the actions, but let's leave the emotions of those disciples living in Acts chapter 1. Let's pay really attention to those emotions. Let's, let's think of those emotions like Thomas, for example. Thomas was so heartbroken. He was in so much deep grief when Jesus died that when, he, that when Jesus resurrected, he couldn't believe that he was alive because if he accepted that he was alive, he could take the risk of losing him again. And that was too much to bear. The pain was too much to say, no, no, if, if he's alive, I could risk losing him again. So th that's too much for me. I, I couldn't take that. So he, he preferred to say, no, I'm not going to believe that. It's too painful. Uh, that, it, that expresses the love that Thomas had for Jesus. And, and that's true for the disciples. They felt this abandonment and then they now believed again at the point of, oh, he resurrected. It's true. He broke this death and everything is possible. And he's starts doing these incredible things like crossing the walls, eating just to prove to them that he is real. So in the middle of this, he has these encounters uh, that are uh, summoned for us in Acts chapter 1, verses, one uh, verses 4 to 9. That's what we're going to read. This is the Passion Translation. Jesus instructed them, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait here until you receive the gift I told you about, the gift of the, the gift the Father had promised. John, for John baptized you in water, but in a few days from now you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Just a few days from now. The book of Corinth tells us that more than 500 people saw a resurrection Erected Jesus. We don't know how many actually gathered the first day in Jerusalem. We don't know how many heard these words actually. But we know that not all of not all of them were patient enough to wait for those days. And we know that Pastor Jim already told us they're waiting because something is necessary that we do in the waiting. There is a growth that happens in our hearts. There is something that is settling down in us while we do the waiting in faith. While we do the waiting thinking, yes, it's coming in a positive attitude. We can wait the other way. We can choose to do the waiting in the negative emotions, but let me tell you, we will receive thanks as long as we do not lose patience because the Holy Spirit came to everyone who was in the room that day, 120. The ones that did not receive the Holy Spirit was the one that left. So wait, wait, because Jesus' promise will happen. 
for everyone, for everyone that is waiting for him. Let's continue. Every time they were gathered together, they asked Jesus. This reveals what they had in mind. Lord, is, it is now the time for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom. And he answered because he never left the disciples without an answer. Probably they did not understand the answers, or probably it's not the answer they wanted to hear, but he never left them without an answer. He answered, the Father is the one who sets the fixed dates and the times of the fulfillment. You are not permitted to know the timing of all that he has prepared in his own authority. But I promise you this, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be seized with power. This is our promise. Now, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be seized with with power. You will be my messengers to Jerusalem, throughout Judea, the distant provinces, and even to the remotest places on earth. <laughs> right after Jesus spoke those words, the disciples saw him being lifted into the sky and disappeared into the cloud. So, Again, it came, it came the emotions of, oh, Jesus is, is living. He's living on the clouds. Oh, and now what's going to happen? What, why does he have to live? Why, why, why can not just work like blowing over them, receiving the Holy Spirit, and after that, they leave. He leaves. Hey. God puts the structure, God puts the methods, God puts the ways, not us. But rest assured, things will happen as he says it will happen. Acts 2 happened just 10 days later. He will never be late. He will never be late. On the day of Pentecost, as it was being fulfilled, they were celebrating the Jewish festival of Pentecost, giving the fruit of the harvest of those days. All the disciples were gathered in one place. The Lord, the Lord really rejoices of those celebrations when we come together and celebrate the festivities. When we come together and celebrate his presence and celebrate his love. <laughs> then after those waiting, though the waiting period, right after that, suddenly, the suddenly happened. Suddenly they heard the sound of a violent blast of wind rushing into the house from out of the heavenly realm. The roar of the wind was so overpowering that it was all anyone could bear. It was not small wind, it was not in the quiet. This called the attention of all the city. Then, all at once, a pillar of fire appeared before their eyes. It separated into tongues of fire that engulfed each one of them. They were all filled and equipped with the Holy Spirit and they were inspired to speak in tongues, empowered by the Holy Spirit to speak in languages they had never learned. <laughs> now, at that time, they were Jewish worshippers who had immigrated from the many different lands to live in Jerusalem. And, it, and then he gave the details of all of them for all of us to know that they were witnesses and they, those witnesses said, it's true. It's true, we hear them speaking in our own dialects, the mighty wonders of God. That says in verse 11, we hear them speaking in our own languages. That is something that doesn't happen every day. It is the wonder of God. They were all struck in awe. 
They all stood there, dumbfounded and astonished, saying to one another, what is that, this phenomenon? They couldn't explain that. But others spoke fun at them, and they said, they are just drunk in new wine. And Peter, our beloved Peter, stood up with the 11 apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, my fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. You need to clearly understand what's happening here. All of us understand what's happening here. This people is not drunk like you think they are, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. This is the fulfillment of what was prophesied through the prophet Joel, for God says, This is what I will do in the last days. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. I will pour out my spirit on everybody. Did I hear everybody? That includes all of us. And cause your sons and daughters to prophesy. And that includes all our sons and daughters and your young men to see visions. That includes all of us. We are all young men. And you're all men to experience the dreams of God. That also includes all of us. We will experience his dreams. The Holy Spirit will come upon all my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. I will reveal starting signs and wonders in the sky above and mighty miracles on the earth below. Blood and fire and pillars of clouds will appear. For the sun will be turned dark and the, and the moon blood red before the great and awesome appearance of the day of the Lord. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter continued, People of Israel, listen to the facts. Jesus, the victorious, I love that name was a man of divine mission, whose authority was clearly proven. For you know how God performed many powerful miracles, signs, and wonders through him. This man's destiny was prearranged, for God knew that Jesus would be handed over to you to be crucified, and that you would execute him on a cross by the hands of lawless men. Yet, it was all part of the predetermined plan. God destroyed the courts of death and raised him up because it was impossible for death's power to hold him prisoner. That's God's plan. That's not our plan. It's a perfect plan. <laughs> and in his grace, on May 7th, 2004, the Holy Spirit baptized us to my wife and I in in a divine act of of grace uh, we, we couldn't ask for it we really didn't know what was it uh, we had a, a wonderful couple of of our tutors in faith uh, we had a Bible study in our home and they came on a Friday night just to have the Bible studied nothing further And they say, we, we feel that the Lord wants to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Do you know what is that? We said, no. They asked, have you ever read Acts chapter 2? We said, no. What is that about? They said, well, do not worry right now. Let's do the Bible study. At the end of it, we will talk about that. And we said, fine. We were curious, but we didn't think anything further. So we grabbed our hands just to pray for the Bible study. We said, Lord, thank you for tonight's Bible study. And then a rushing wind crossed over our windows and took us over, all of us. And it was my experience. That wind was so strong over me that took me to the ground. And I only could react by worshiping Jesus. His presence was so strong that I spent time worshiping. I, I couldn't do anything else. But then I saw 
something in front of me. And Jesus was right after that. And that something was blocking intimacy between Jesus and I. I realized that that something was unconfessed sin. And I was so sorry of, of having that. Oh, it was, it was so easy to say, Lord, I'm sorry. I confess the sin. I repent of all that. I'm sorry. I, I have no idea that this grieves you so much. So I was there for more minutes, you know, like 45 minutes, confessing, repenting, crying. I was left with no voice after that. But after that, he felt me with the joy and with laughter. And then I was just in laughter for a good while as well. Oh my, I was in, in pain and all this abdominal area because I, I couldn't stand anymore that joy. And then the fire came in a great wave. It started in the UC campus. We used, around, we used to live around campus those days. So it started in the UC campus and took the streets of Cincinnati. And I could see the fire, the flames just covering the city and invaded the house we were in. And it was such a great fire. And I started laughing again because such a great fire. How could, how could it be described as a small tongue of fire? It was such a big fire that consumed me and consumed everything was not was not his in me he loved me more and then i worshiped again and then i was able to, to speak in tongues something that i didn't know how i didn't know existed and i was able to to intercede and intercede in different languages i didn't know that and then uh, I had this treasure inside of me and I wanted to share it with everyone. So I grabbed the phone and I just called everyone that I knew from church and people that did not go to church those days. And some of those, some of the, the people came at around midnight. So like, you know, four or five hours after all these events started and people just came and anyone who agreed to pray with me i prophesied over them i never had prophesied before over anyone but that was the fire in me i i it was very hard i i, I couldn't sleep that night um, because the power was on me and you know people left like three four in the morning and they went home and i just kept interceding for other people I, I had no voice so I I don't know how I did it just on my knees and next day we had a, a little uh, fasting and prayer time with other people in church and my wife gave a message by God those days uh, wonderful as well and then on Sunday we went to two services and, and what I remember is that I was so sensitive to God I remember how God connected with the hearts of the people and he wanted to have communion and intimacy and this love for everyone how and i just wanted to say to everyone god loves you he wants to connect with you he he wants to knock at your door and have dinner with you just would you let him in he loves you he he wants to love you as, as a father let him in let him in so that happened 19 years ago. Would you, would you let me share some of the consequences of that in my life? Because that changed me forever. One of them is that I really understood that it was just based in love. I didn't do anything to earn. It was a completely supernatural experiences, experience, but it allowed me to understand that it's possible. That whatever he promised, whatever he, he says, even though it sounds impossible, it is possible. He also changed 
all that fear of rejection that I used to have, uh, particularly when, when I needed to do some sharing of, of something that would be, wow, they, they are going to reject me because what I'm gonna try to tell them it sounds ridiculous or sounds impossible. Well, it's, it was completely reduced. I, I wouldn't call it disappeared because I'm, I'm, I'm still human and many times, you know, I have thoughts saying, oh, yeah, they, they wouldn't like that. They're probably gonna think that I am crazy, but that's, that's all right. Also, uh, this, this event gives me confidence that Jesus is with me when he asks me to do something. And, uh, and I obey, he said, oh no, he's gonna be with me because he's sending me to do this. Number two, it's a good thing to just repent and confess sin. It connects us with God. It's a good thing. He will not shame anyone. It is a path to intimacy. It's a good thing. Our rational minds many times say, no, no, it's a bad idea that you confess. You will be ashamed. You, you will be uh, rejected people will will mock you well it's not like that Jesus will never shame you he will never mock you he loves you you will be lifted up by Jesus number three it gives me an eternal perspective right here on earth because I, I used to make decisions just thinking oh what's gonna happen here and now and that the consequences of my decisions were you know, right on my retirement and a few late, a few years, you know, 20, 25, 30 years after that. But now, no, my, my decisions have eternal consequences forever, some of them. And I need to have that mindset so I can make the right decision. Impact my generations here on earth but impact myself and my generations on heaven as well. And that's the right mindset when I make any kind of decision. Four, it gave me the faith to believe, to think it's possible. When, when I did not experience any miracles by myself, anything that breaks the physics of this natural realm, I was thinking that miracles are part of history and are not part of, of their ordinary believers' uh, life. I was just thinking, oh, those are just for a few anointed, are not for everybody. But since this event happened in my life, I'm thinking, yes, it's for me. It is for an ordinary believer. It's for everybody. And I'm happy to do that. And, I'm, and I, I'm encouraged to to pray and to share that with anyone. Thank you for that. Number five, I want to share my experience with anyone. I really found the treasure. I really found Jesus in, in such a way, it's so real to me. I say, I can sell everything. I can abandon everything else and go after him. I can call anyone and say, yes, he is real. I can testify, he loves you. I can witness of that, he loves you. And finally, a message that he gave me that night, and this is very important for him. He told me, the church is one. There's nothing that is divided in segments of the church. He's not coming from different wives with different names or denominations. He's coming for one church, for one wife. He loves one church. And the church is his. He said, the church is mine. Nobody has authority over him, over the church. He sets the calls. He's calling the shots here at church and the church is holy. We are not any more redeemed sinners. We are a holy church because we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. We are little heavens walking on earth in perfect communion with Him. 
we need to honor his blessing. Have a great day, everyone. Have a blessed time with Jesus on earth. And if anyone needs more of the Spirit, just ask him. If we who are imperfect parents, we know how to give good gifts to our children, he who is a perfect father will give the Holy Spirit to anyone who asks. Just ask for more because there is more. Be blessed. Amen.